And we'll start with an opening from Martha, if you would, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being here tonight to learn more about this important measure. The social compact had always been that if people worked hard, they could have a safe, stable place to call home. But in the last number of years, rents have been rising much, much more quickly than incomes have been rising. And we are seeing an increasing number of people experiencing homelessness. The homeless school student count showed that there were more than 20,000 children in Oregon, school-aged children in Oregon, who are experiencing homelessness. Um, if you consider the kids from zero to five, that number is probably double. So homelessness is affecting an awful lot of people. In the past, affordable, housing affordability was coming from a, a combination of different sources, um, but those sources are not there to support that anymore. We need to have local government step up, and that's what the Metro Bond measure will do, is step up to help support affordable housing across our region. Jordan? Uh, I should start by saying I'm speaking strictly for myself, certainly not for Portland State University or the Center for Real Estate where I work. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, think the, I think there are two main problems with this measure. One is that it's not particularly helpful in terms of the housing market. I agree certainly that we need to reduce rents and reduce prices in our region uh, by adding supply. But if you look at the measure, it purports, along with the state measure, if that's passed as well, to produce 30 3,900 3, housing units with 30-year bonds. If you do the division, that's 130 housing units per year. 130 housing units per year is puny in a four-county area that produces 12 to 14,000 housing units for, for, per year. So it won't have any measurable impact on market rents or market prices as a result of the project. The second uh, concern that I would have about it is just how few people are being helped and how this is poor uh, social welfare policy. Generally, when we have social welfare policy, we want everyone to benefit, not such a small fraction of the eligible population. Here we go. If this fails, what would you recommend to meet the need? Well, I, I, I have argued for a long time that we need a vigorous housing production uh, program within our, within, our, uh, within our metro area. We underproduced by about 50,000 housing units during the Great Recession. But if you looked at the way in which we're permitting units right now, we're probably about 10% below what we were in 1990 to 2007. So we both got a huge deficit in terms of overall market level of housing production. And despite the fact that our population is much higher than it used to be, we're producing less than we were before. I think the problem lies with Metro. <laughs> I mean, that's part of the irony. The Metro is, it has only expanded the urban growth boundary by 10% in 40 years, when the population has grown by over 80%. Uh, we also have the city of Portland, who's implemented an inclusionary zoning policy, which has basically shut down the multifamily market. Uh, so while we're producing quite a few units right now that are apartments, we won't be producing very many at all in 2020 in, in the city of Portland. So I think there are real problems, but I don't think this has anything to do with those problems. Martha? As an affordable housing developer for 16 years in a nonprofit and for 22 years with the city of Portland before that, I've been working on the issue of affordable housing. We have basically been cobbling together every penny that we can find to do as much as we can, and we are not keeping pace. We need more investment, and we need it to be substantial, and we need to have effective mechanisms to do that. There are definitely issues uh, in expediting the development process, streamlining it, simplifying it. I would agree with all those things, but that will not in itself produce affordable housing. It may produce more housing, but not affordable housing. Um, so if we don't do this, I think we need to, again, go back to each local government, ask what they can do, go back to the state and go back to the federal government and ask what they can do. But we need to prepare ourselves for the number of people that will be homeless in our communities. Okay, and Martha, try this one. Is it known what share of funds will be spent to build new units, increasing the total number available, and what share will be spent to renovate existing units? And if not, how will that decision be made? The decision will be made by the local governments that are participating in this, so the housing authorities or the county governments, um, along with a couple of cities who have said that they want to be active in that. 
Um, the framework was designed, the modeling about how many units could be produced was designed with the notion that up to 50% could be acquisition of existing buildings. You may remember the Holgate Manor was in the media a while back, a strong community that was suddenly upended because of a sale of that property. That's a kind of example where you might want to go in and acquire a property and um, uh, preserve it, basically. Uh, but there's also new construction that can be built. Ultimately, that will be the decision of the different jurisdictions, how much they spend on one and how much on the other. But again, the, the modeling, the framework was based on a 50-50 split. Any comment? Certainly, if you're looking for how fast you can implement the program um, and reduce the cost, you would want to buy existing units. And that's both because it's, uh, it can happen right away, but also because the depreciated nature of those existing units is a good match for the uh, financial abilities of the households who'd be renting them. Um, you know, you, you would not, so the alternative, which is to build a lot of new housing, which, um, which will happen from this project, or from this uh, uh, proposal, will be building a lot of expensive housing. Typically in our region, you know, new, new single family home construction sells for about $110,000 more per housing unit than, than existing housing does. Um, and the same applies to apartments. New apartments are going to have that new apartment smell. Uh, they're not going to have mossy roofs or cracked sidewalks in front. They, they are going to rent for a much higher price than existing units. And so if we were to focus on existing units, we would get more bang for the buck. But of course, again, we would be reducing no housing. And I just got the question, so hold on, Gerard. Uh, developers complain that affordable housing projects don't pencil out meaning that they can't make profits. How can we change the situation? How, how can I change reality is the question you're asking me. I mean, it's a bit like trying to ask, you know, why don't car makers make $5,000 cars? You can find $5,000 cars, but nobody's producing them new. So again, if, you know, if you're gonna shop for, if you're gonna shop for a, you know, an inexpensive car, you go to 82nd Street, you find a car that's you know, lived a life and is now ready for you. And I think the same, the same thing would apply to, to households if we gave them vouchers. The, the low-income households would look for units that were built 40, 50 years ago. Um, they would be, have extra buying power because of the voucher, and that's how they would, that's how they would find housing. Worth uh, okay, let's see. A couple things there. One, the voucher notion. Yes, people could use vouchers to find housing. Um, it has resulted in concentrations of poverty across our region that are unhealthy, that have created places where kids are not thriving, where there's not opportunity um, for people to have access to transportation, to jobs, to good schools, all the things that they need to thrive. So having uh, a program that really just says, let them find the cheapest unit on the market, the most substandard unit on the market, the um, worst neighborhood in the region as a solution is not a good way to create a healthy community. Um, the, the rents that will be charged are gonna be rents that are based on what people can afford. So if you think of somebody who is on Social Security, average Social Security, $1,200 a month, that household shouldn't pay more than about 500 for their housing. This program will allow them to pay that and do it in a, in a healthy unit, in a healthy environment. We turn now to our closings. And Martha, if you get started, Ooh. take a big breath. <laughs> right. This goes very quickly. <laughs> um, you know, again, we started with the premise that if people worked hard, they could have a safe, stable place to call home. They might even have an opportunity for home ownership. That is now out of reach for most of the people who are hardworking people with lower incomes. We have kids moving from school to school, trying to find a place that's affordable because the rent where they're at is getting um, raised again by hundreds of dollars. We need to start addressing this problem in a serious way. This measure really is a big step forward in terms of doing that. Um, I hope that 
we can ensure that people have the safe place to call home, um, and this measure will help do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jordan? I'm going to respond mostly to Martha's recent comments because I think they need to be corrected. I, I do not think this is a big step forward. I think this is a little step backwards. I think if you were to look at uh, housing projects that they've been built in the United States for the last 70 years, those are the pockets of poverty. I mean, I think that but if you look at if you look at how vouchers are actually spent, it's true. Yes, people people will spend them in the neighborhoods that they're familiar with, but they'll make adjustments according to their preferences. They're very decentralized. There is no ribbon cutting with a Section 8 voucher in the same way there's a ribbon cutting with the construction or the acquisition of a new housing project. Martha also says that rents are going to be tailored as a percentage of income. That's not exactly true. To do that, what the counties are going to have to do is to just is to take some of their existing vouchers and can turn, convert them into project-based assistance. And for new construction, my understanding is, is that's exactly what the proponents are hoping to do. So what my fear is is that a lot of the recipients are really going to lose the choice that they would normally get through vouchers and instead be forced into a particular unit that they may or may not need. Okay, thank you. And my thanks to both of you. As we can tell, this is a complex issue and you've made it very, well, your answers were clear. I don't know that you made the issue clear, <laughs> but at any rate. So, um, I would also like to thank Metro East Community Media for recording and for all the volunteers and for the audience with your questions. Please check our website, lwvpdx.org, to view all our forums and for TV replay information. For more election information, pick up our nonpartisan voters guide, which is in the back of the room here for you locally, at the local public library, New Seasons Market, or Meals on Wheels Dining Center, or go to vote411.org. I also want to alert you that there is, in fact, a contested circuit court judge position, which is described in here. It's something that doesn't usually happen, so you may want to get that information. Election day is November 6. As in all Oregon elections, you will receive a mail-in ballot. Ballots must be delivered to an official drop-off site no later than 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 6, or mailed back early enough to arrive by that time. Postmarks do not count. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here, for being informed. Remember that your vote is very important. And thanks for your